All right, guys, returning to the program is one of the most recognizable personalities in the world of MMA, a UFC Hall of Famer, former UFC heavyweight champion, and three-time King of Pancrase. You see him every week as a host on Inside MMA as well as a commentator for World Series of Fighting. It is a pleasure to welcome back El Guapo, Bas Rutinus, and Mish Radio. Bas, how's it going today? Doing great, sitting outside in the sun. It's cooling down a little bit here in California. It was hot today. Hey, uh, well, it's heating up here in Australia as well, Bas. So we're enjoying the warmth across the world. Now, before we get into the crazy world of MMA, we want to get an update on the O2 trainer. We spoke about it with you last year. We've heard it's been helping a lot of people, and we've actually seen it sponsoring some big events. What's the latest? How's it all going? Well, the latest is we're uh, we're we're. We're probably, there's like a 95% certainty we're going to go public. So uh, that will help me a lot. Uh, these people really, they saw it and they realized, okay, this is a real good product. I have an updated model in mind. So we're going to make a, a new model for it. Uh, some people were drooling <laughs> and uh, I found a way for that to, to stop like that. I, I can stop it by swallowing, but I have good control over my over everything in my head, in, mm. in my head and in my body. So some people couldn't, and then they start splashing all over the place. They said, "So oh, I wow. figured it out. I figured what it was, and um, and that's it." So so that would be cool because then I can buy commercial time on TV and make a, rec- a commercial spot, and that hopefully is going to introduce introduce it to more people. That's awesome. Are you going to be like, <clears throat> are you going to be like Mike Dolce? Because here in Australia and probably in America, we get those like uh, UFC fit commercials with Mike Dolce and stuff. Are you going to be like that? Are you going to be starring these commercials, boss, for the O2 trainer? Yeah, you know, in the, in the past they told me, you know, with acting, they said, you know, you don't do acting and don't do uh, uh, commercials because it's not good. I go, okay. Once I become an actor who actually lives from acting money, yeah, a professional, I'll do that. <laughs> yeah, All yeah. Right? You know, doing a movie here and there, it's, uh, I'm, I'm not considered a professional, trust me. So uh, I, I go with whatever I need to go, and that's this. Man, you are a professional. I mean, here comes the boom, that dance, that still <laughs> makes me laugh. That was awesome. Now, also for the people who don't know, you've got an online store that has some pretty cool stuff like your workout DVD, signed gloves. Just wondering, what are some of your favorite items fans can check out on the site? You know, it's the workout. The workout, actually, because I always say this for the last six months, I've been saying, oh, the new workout is going to come out. The workout is the hottest thing that is on, on, on the site. It's an audio mm-hmm. workout with my voice. I'm selling that for already 11 years. We saw tons of that. I mean, every 90% of the pros use it. There's a lot of guys because it's a really good and a fast and a, and a hard workout. And then I'm, I'm really uh, I'm kind of amazed because I made this really cool poster which contains um, 1,380 pictures. Wow. So when Ooh. you stand away from it, it's me with two belts. The closer you get, you realize, oh, they're all little tiny pictures from my entire fight career, baby pictures, modeling pictures, believe it or not, like a lot of funny pictures in there. And uh, I thought, you know, people should really know that because it's, uh, if, if you're interested in, 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 my, in my past, everything that I did is pretty much on that poster. That's actually really, really cool. I would definitely consider buying that, and I'm not, I'm not just blowing smoke up your ass. I gotta ask you there, boss. Is the Bass Root and Self Defense DVD available? You know the one that's set in the bar, and the famous bang, bang, thangana, thangana. Is the, is that one available on your website by any chance? It is, it is available. Wow. Also on the, on the website, <laughs> the Street Fighting. Yeah, we we changed the cover a little bit, and uh, but it's uh, it's still hilarious. I still, I have still, you know. Um, Last time at the airport, I walked out of the plane. There were two air marshals. You know, they gave me a pin and they said, man, we're working out on your workout. And they also had the street fighting DVD. That's also <laughs> how I met them for the first time. All these guys, you know, at the lounge, at the United Lounge. That was a, that was a funny story. because I don't, Maybe I, I, I told it before, but there were, I was sitting waiting for my plane. And there's like five or six guys there talking. And every time they're looking at me. But they don't look happy. It's not like they're smiling at me. And I go... Okay, something's going down, you know, but mm. uh, something's going on. So suddenly they all get up and they start walking towards me. So I get up and I start walking towards them. <laughs> and, then, and, and they see that I'm that serious. So they go, whoa, 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 whoa. I say, what's going on here? And he goes, no, we're air marshals. We got your DVD. I said, dude, I thought you, I thought you guys were going to come for me. And they started <laughs> laughing. I said, and you actually went towards us instead of walking away. I say, oh, well, I figured... You know, intimidate a little bit, go straight into the, you know, if I can't avoid it anymore, might as well go straight into it. And they were laughing. They sent me the caps, you know, with the special air marshal caps with my name embroidered. They were the great people. 
I love it. They're using the DVD to keep the airways safe. Very, very interesting. <laughs> now, you mentioned to us that you were doing some work recently for UFC Fight Pass. Can you tell us about the project? What sort of videos were you working on? Um, let me see. Let me go real fast because I'm. Uh, it was also it was actually last week as well. We did. I did a few um, promos for the for, for. Oh, that's it for the older Pancras fights. You know, because Pancras mm-hmm. is now available on UFC Fight Pass. Uh, also, they yeah. live stream it from Japan, so you can watch live <clears throat> shows now on Fight Pass. And uh, I did a promotion for theirs, you know, saying, hey, listen, man, I was one of the first guys there. Mm-hmm. You know, I wasn't the first show fought there. It's a great group of guys came from there. A lot of the UFC champions were made in Pancras. So maybe it's fun for you guys to check out the old style and I explain the rules of Pancras, you know, because they're all different with the rope escapes and eight counts. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is MMA, <laughs> you know. So that was that was a weird thing. But what people don't realize, I always say, is we got so much more work done in a fight, like for instance, in one fight, I won that fight because I submitted a guy five times. Five times is a maximum amount. F- the fifth time, you're done. But what happens if, if I get him in a submission, he's close to the rope and he can touch the rope, I have to let him go. But it's going to be a lost point for him, like same as an eight count. You lose a point. And then if you have five of those in total, you know, you, you, you lose the fight. Now, if the fight goes to a decision and let's say you had two rope escapes and one knockdown and I didn't have any, of course, I'm going to win. So that's how they were counting. So if you look at my record, I have like 15 uh, submission victories and 10 knockouts. But those 15 submission victories were like 35. Mm-hmm. I did 35 submissions because every time when you wow. got somebody in submission, he got them. Then they restart the fight back on the feet. So you fought another fight. So sometimes you fought five fights in one fight. So you had more ring time, so to say. Crazy. It was one of the awesome things of uh, Pancras, and who better to explain him than yourself? Now, Buzz, we were scrolling through Twitter, and we saw that you and Dwayne Ludwig uh, enjoyed Johnny Depp's new movie, Black Mass, which obviously has an Aussie connection in Joel Edgerton. Give us the breakdown. What did you like about the movie? You know, I I, I, I truly believe that Depp should uh, get nominated for this. He's the scary dude in this movie. It's always with him. When he plays somebody, when he really goes into it, whether it's a, a funny character or not, He's a really good actor, as, just as him, I don't know. But every time, like, th- he really got into this, man. There's this scene, I don't know if you saw the movie, but there's the scene where they're sitting at the table, and uh, there, he, he starts to talk about the steak. And, uh, and that's this, the only is, this thing is in Black it. Mass, right? This is in Black Mass. Right, spoiler yeah. alert, anyone who hasn't seen the movie, but continue, yeah. Buss. No, 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 I'm not going to say what it is, but okay. just remember that scene. Once they sit there, and then he starts, and you go like, okay. You know, that's a scary. It's almost like the... Um, uh, what's his name? And uh, are you talking to me? You you, you think I'm funny? <laughs> nah, you, yeah. If it's it's like that, like in Casino, you know. That's an. Uh, oh, no, that was not Casino, right? That was, no, was Taxi Bat- Driver. Robert taxi De Niro. Driver, yeah. No, no, no. I mean the other one. I mean uh, that he says, "Are you uh, me? You think I'm funny?" Joe Pesci. Yep, yep. That, but I, I, it's one of the two movies. It's either Goodfellas or it's in Casino. I think it's in Goodfellas. Okay, yeah. And it's kind of a scene like that. And it it gets really dark suddenly, and you go, "Whoa, this!" I I would not want to be in a situation like that. I'll tell you what. Speaking of situations, uh, Johnny Depp he brought in his dog to Australia. I don't know if you heard about this, boss, but he brought in his dog to Australia, and he did it illegally. And now um, the government's actually taking his wife to uh, to court. And if she gets convicted, 11 years in prison. So that's some crazy stuff that's happening right now in Australia. But back to back to the interview. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, it's it must have been a cute dog. It's thing I've ever heard. It's like Nick Diaz. You know, it's like it's like <laughs> marijuana being on a list. You know, it shouldn't be there. But, you know, unfortunately, it is there. And then you have to live by rules. You know, if, if you couldn't take in Tylenol and you get caught, well, I wouldn't get caught a second time because I know now, okay, don't take Tylenol. You know, I'm so it's a it's a shame that there are even rules like that. Well, oh, all right, you, sure. you, I mean, Charles Charles Sonnen's going to create some T-shirts. Hashtag free Johnny Depp's wife. <laughs> <laughs> you, well, you 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 brought it up. So let let's talk about this Nick Diaz thing. Uh, you know, here's the thing about that though. Technically, he didn't fail because apparently one of the tests was ridiculously out of bounds. The other two, the wider accredited ones, were were all fine. They were within the normal levels. What do you think about this whole situation? Yeah, no, if that's the case, yeah, then of course, th- listen, they're going to go to normal court, you know, and, and, and this is going to get squashed. This is not going to do anything. You, If you go to in front of the athletic commission, feelings, people, feelings are involved as well. Oh, wasn't he that he fought 
at the World Series of Fighting event. Outside, he was in the audience. He was fighting. All these people know these things. So all these things now count. In a normal court, they won't count. They're, they're, they have to be dismissed. So then he gets caught for the third time. And did, did he deny it or did he say, uh, but because everybody knows he's a smoker. So let's just say, let's just say that the high level is correct. Let's just say that for now. It, it, it is annoying, but it is a rule. You know, the first time he got 20% fine, then he got 30%, and the last one I think it was 35% fine. Well, the, the, the numbers got much and much higher. The last time I think he lost $60,000. And now this one, it's, of course, way more. So he knew that if he was going to get caught again, you know, he, he was going to have to pay that. And I say, why don't you just simply do not smoke? It is a rule. Is a stupid rule? Is the dumbest rule. You know, it shouldn't be in there, but it is there. And you have to live by it. It's the same as in Holland. You can drink, drink in a, a beer behind the wheel as long as you don't exceed the, the maximum blood, uh, blood oh, alcohol. That's awesome. Yeah. You know, so. <laughs> for here to me it goes oh you cannot even have an open container in the car dude I'm not drinking it's open but I'm not even drinking you can test me no it's not even allowed you it's a stupid rule to me it's a stupid rule but you know it is a rule so you won't see me driving around with an open container of alcohol in the car you see so you have to simply live by those rules and I hope that he goes to court and that it gets squashed away five years even when everything was right no that was way too much of course you know that's a career killer right there but you know, with three years, two years at least, I thought that was that was going to be necessary. But I'm talking about the fact that at that moment, I thought that the test was 100 percent. You know, so I now I hear and I heard that before. Also, people told me, you know, if if they cannot really prove it, well, then it's going to get dismissed at all. I mean, if two tests say, give the normal levels and the other one doesn't, mm. well, something's going down. So I'm pretty sure when he goes to court, like a normal court, just like that Vendelay Silva did. Everything will be okay. Mm. And I guess one of the things about the whole situation that sort of put a sour taste in the MMA community's mouth is just the fact that it seems like he got punished because he pleaded the fifth. And but although doesn't that isn't that like a constitutional right over there in your country for him not to have to talk? But it seems like he got the maximum punishment because the Nevada State Athletic Commission felt like he was being disrespectful. And it didn't really seem like they took what his lawyer said into account, but more into account the fact that he chose not to speak. Yeah, I mean, but it's, it's, it's like I said, it's a, that's in a real court, that would have been a great idea. This is not a real court. Mm. This is like I said, okay, he got caught for a DOI. He got caught for fighting there in, the, in, in, in Vegas as well. All these things, those are in the memory as well of these people. Then he got uh, caught twice before for a smoky Mary one, and now he comes in and he, for them – it's an attitude now, you know, and then, of course, because they're human, they're going to react and they're going to do the they, they give him a way worse penalty than he deserves. But in normal court, that wouldn't happen. If he pleads the fifth in normal court, there's, there's nobody takes offense to that. But this is nobody ever did it. And now suddenly he does it, you know, and every time the way he says it, you know, there's certain ways. Listen, if his lawyer would have gone to these people and he would have said, I said, if there's one person on the planet, you know, who needs marijuana to just simply function, it's Nick Diaz. I think we proved that the last time. He knew that when he was going to get caught, he was going to have to pay $60,000. I mean, somebody who gives up $60,000 of his purse, well, he probably really needs it. You know, there, and if he would have said, and then uh, Nick Diaz would have simply said, you know what, yeah, I messed up, you know, but it is, you know, I cannot function without this stuff. I guarantee you it, it would have never been like this. You know, it's uh, it's just now they're human people and it's not a court court. And then, yeah, doing things like this will affect them because, like I said, it, it, it makes them angry. And once it makes them angry, well, they're the one who uh, who hold the cards at that moment. So a uh, new court and uh, get get rid of this thing. That's what's going to happen. Yeah, no, that's a great perspective, boss. Just wondering, you know, Nick Diaz, he gets a bit of a bad rap because he's not great at communicating. He's not really a guy that, you know, is clear in his words and he seems a little bit uncomfortable in front of the camera. Um, do you think that he's sort of gotten a bad rap in his career because he's unable to sort of express or sort of explain how he feels and what he thinks? Yeah, no, for sure. I, I think that either it, it – any of these people would have sat one down, uh, sat down at a table when, uh, when having dinner with Nick Diaz. He's a really funny guy. Once he starts, you know, and he's loose, he's, he's really, he's a really funny guy. He was a great guest on our show, and later we went to sushi, and he's a very funny guy. And you see a totally different Nick than you see out there. 
some people simply have that and and but that's the only thing those people see you know and then they automatically assume you know that's how don't judge a book by its cover that but that's with Nick and that problem he has you know and the, and the way to get rid of it is just talk to these people but then again he's not a good talker so what should he do oh, let's plead the fifth yeah because normally in court that will be absolutely no problem but now yeah here it is a problem apparently mm. I feel like Nick Diaz expresses himself best when he's when he's actually fighting. Although inside MMA, you guys need to do like a eating sushi with Nick Diaz special. I think that would do great. But <laughs> we'll go back to what we were talking about before. You and Dwayne uh, Dwayne Ludwig going to the movies. I'm just curious. You know, I'm pretty sure you guys are very close friends. I was always wondering when did you guys first meet and how did this friendship start to the point where you guys watch your movies together? Oh, a long time ago. I, I did the Boss Roots and Invitationals about, uh, in Colorado about 16 years ago, I think. Mm. And uh, a lot of big fighters came from that organization. Even Jens Pulver, who was the first UFC champion, came from that organization. Mm. There were, we had so many fighters sign up there that uh, there was one fight was a 16-man tournament. Like You had to fight wow. four times in order <laughs> to get there. And this was in Colorado. So it was crazy. I did. A, I was very smart by getting the the, the former um, matchmaker of the UFC, John Peretti. I said, "Listen, man, why don't you come with me? You be you're the judge, or the the referee," and and of course it worked because everybody wants to perform in front of that referee because then they have a chance to go to the UFC. So everybody came, and it was a great show. And, and Dwayne was one of these guys. And I remember there was one fight. Uh, Dwayne's opponent fell. Um, uh, didn't want to fight Dwayne. So we asked in the audience if somebody wanted to fight, you know. I mean, this was <laughs> wild wild west in yeah. Colorado. <laughs> and, uh, and this guy stands up. He's all fight him. And he's like 25 pounds heavier. And I look at Dwayne. And I go, and Dwayne is young. I mean, I just found a picture I sent today to Dwayne. I will post it on Twitter in, uh, uh, right after this interview. You're going to laugh so hard. that you can see how really young he was when I met him. And, um, and he says, no, sure, I fight him. And he knocked him out with a high kick. Wow. And uh, I go, man, this kid is crazy. And then we, we, yeah, we became friends instantly, you know. And uh, every show, I did like five shows there or so. Every time he was there, he was helping out. Either was fighting on the show or he was not, you know. And if he was there, and maybe he had an, a fight of himself one time. I went to his show. He fought in Colorado in a Thai boxing event, won the title there when I was there. So we started getting, uh, yeah, to hang out more together. Then I went there for the Randleman fight to train high altitude. I wanted to try that one time before uh, before a fight because I never did. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was there also every day for me, helping me out. Mm. Well, it's interesting because obviously there were some comments made by Uriah Faber recently, some allegations about some of the things that Dwayne did while teaching a team alpha male. You know, Uriah cited that Dwayne refused to train women, made a certain, certain gym members feel uncomfortable due to racist jokes, and even flipped out in his manager. Obviously, you're very, very close to Dwayne. What were your thoughts on these statements that Uriah made? You know, I, I, you know, to me, it's, uh, it's not true. I, that's what I think. You know, I know. I, I asked any person, ask any other fighter on the planet, uh, mm -hmm. what they think of Dwayne, and I don't think one person will say he's a disrespectful guy. You know, when he said, "Oh, he's a racist." Uh, with uh, black guys, the, the the furthest away from the truth. What 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 happened in that situation? And he does these things for fun, and that's kind of a Dutch cr insane hu humor that he has. But he does it right in front of the guy. So he like there's 40 people and there's one black guy, and he says, "Okay, I'm sorry, but you're gonna have to stand in the back." And then everybody starts laughing. That's the joke. And then this guy starts laughing because it's fun. We don't these. He's not making a you know. It's it, it's a fun thing. He tries to crack a laugh, and everybody mm -hmm. loves it, including that person, you know. And then to use that example, I go, "Come on, man! I mean, everybody who was there at the seminar knew that it's absolutely not true. <laughs> he will do that with anybody. If it's the, uh, the other way around, if there's only uh, black guys and there's one white guy, he says to the white guy, hey, you gotta let me click this way. You gotta you gotta stand in the back of the line.' He's doing like." He's doing that with everybody. So it's just this way of humor and being funny. And But, you know, if he would do it secretly, he says, oh, man, that guy, you know, I'd rather have him standing in the back. But it's not. He's, um, he's making a joke out of it. So, you know, I, I asked everybody at uh, Velasquez, um, uh, coach Javier Mendez, he was on a show, and we were talking about it. I said, what do you think of Dwayne? You know, and he says, this is the, the nicest gentleman I've ever seen in my life. I said, see, that's why I'm going. And I start ev asking every fighter, and everybody has the same words. So... I, I don't believe it. I know Dwayne too well. He's just a really good guy. 
Mm, no, certainly. And I mean, TJ Dillashaw, a great example of someone who loves Dwayne. Just wondering, just the whole point of him not training women. I mean, does he have a problem with women's MMA? What's what's the thought process behind him not wanting to train women? I, I don't think he, 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 what he says is not like he doesn't like women fighting. He doesn't, uh-huh. he thinks it's unnatural when women get hit in the face. He doesn't like to see that. That's his thing. It's mm-hmm. not like he has anything against the techniques. I would like Rousey. He already he talks always great about Rousey and, and about great women fighters. But he says to me, it feels unnatural when I see a woman get beat in the face. You know, it's not in a, in the, you know, the, the the first time. I think also, and, and they, the, the, he was on the, the show with uh, Brandon Schaub, you know, the fighter and the kid, mm. and uh, and he was also talking about. They, they were also talking about the fact, you know, when you, when you see um, Cyborg for the first time against Gina Carano. You know, yeah, you can kind of understand. Okay, that is, it's, it's a, it's a weird picture. But you know, these women choose for it, and they want to do it, so it's all good. He just says that. He doesn't say anything about the technique of the women or about being bad. No, he just says, I thought it was unnatural when a woman gets punched hard in the face. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I, I understand where you're coming from. The big news, obviously, Bass, is that TJ Dillashaw, one of his main and probably most famous students, is moving to Colorado, train at a new facility, and also work with Dwayne. It's interesting, considering that Team Alpha Male has been such a major factor in him becoming who he is today. Do you think this was the best move for him going into possibly his toughest fight against Dominic Cruz? Well, yeah, he did it last time as well. You know, he, he went to Dwayne also to train with Dwayne. I think uh, they just... Th- there's a connection. Some... You know, that's a once in a lifetime opportunity. Something like that happens when a coach really clicks with the fighter and instantly when they meet, he changes him completely as a fighter, as a striker. And of course, he had the great wrestling and the submissions already all there from the uh, team alpha male guy. So but then to tie everything together, that was Dwayne. He came and suddenly, boom, they changed. All the numbers went up from everybody over there. And he just thought, okay, listen, I became a world champion with Dwayne on my side. So he, he chooses for Dwayne. I, I think it's a logic thing. Never break a winning combination, guys. That's the one thing I said mm-hmm. in my entire life. I always did my same workouts, my same stretches, and everybody was bored. They say, dude, you're doing the same stretch for the last 15 years. I say, yeah, guess what? I never had an injury when I did these stretches. So why would I change it? Because then there might be a possibility I'm going to you know, get an injury. Mm-hmm. So as long as it works, you never want to change it. And that's it. And that's what they did. They connect good. I can totally understand it. Well, let's switch, let's switch topics for a second and speak about a guy who hasn't changed his training, I don't think, ever in his career, Fedor Emelianko. Um, he's a guy that you and me, uh, you and us spoke to last time you were on the program. You, now, you pr- actually predicted, this wasn't on our show, but you actually predicted that he may be going to Japan before it was announced. Now that it's official, what are your thoughts on the situation? Because when you were on our program last, you mentioned how you thought going to the UFC would be an important thing for his legacy. Yeah, I, and I think I still uh, think it is. We we just have to see. We don't know what kind of contract he has. He's playing a very smart game. If he goes to the UFC, there is a chance that he gets thrown in front of the wolves right away. He didn't fight for a while. You know, his injuries are gone, and he goes, okay, I can make a big bank here in 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 Japan. Plus, on top of that, I don't fight the kind of competition that I'm going to face in the UFC. So maybe this is just warm up. Maybe he fights three times, and he said it's in the contract. We don't know, but I again here I go with my conspiracy theory, <laughs> and he says, you know, maybe I just fight three times here, and then my contract is going to be free. I'm I'm allowed to go anywhere. So now we can figure out how he feels in the fights. If he feels comfortable and he feels strong enough, then hopefully he's, he's going to the UFC, which I always think any fighter on the planet eventually needs to do. If if they're still in their prime, like we're talking, he's he's a little older right now already, you know. And mm. to me, he can never lose. He can never lose that title. The the greatest. I I I, I still believe that he's the man. Uh, so he, even if he loses and what he did in the past, it doesn't take anything away from what he did for mixed martial arts. But you know, as a fighter, it's uh, and I explained that last time as well. Is it's like you're playing football. You want to end up in the NFL. That's it, because that's the goal. Everybody knows that organization is the best fighters on the planet. It, it is, and not saying it's, they have the best fighters on the planet. In order to get the true recognition, you want to you be a, a world champion there. I think I, if I wouldn't have gone to the UFC, I, I think I would have been way less known than, I, uh, than, than now. 
Mm-hmm. Well, you, you've got a bit of a relationship with Fedor. Obviously, you guys aren't close friends, but you were around Japan for a lot of his fights. You know, knowing what you know about him, do you think that matters to him? Do you think going to the UFC matters to him for his legacy? Do you think he sort of thinks like that? You know, if I really think about it, yeah. And, and the reason I'm saying that is, listen, he doesn't need to do it for the money. He's got money enough. You know, mm-hmm. this guy never has to work again. You know, he has money enough, and especially in Russia, that money, the amount of money he made in Japan, it goes a long way. Trust me that. You know, it's just <laughs> a few generations. So he's he's going to be well taken care of. So I don't believe he's doing it for the money. So if you're not doing it for the money, well, you're doing it because you love the sport. If you do love the sport, well, then you, you know, once he fights one fight and he wins, and the second fight he wins, he, I, I hope, I hope I'm right <laughs> this is going to gun for the UFC title. Man, you, you, you and us both, we all we all hope the same thing. I know people are really bummed out about how it's all played out, you know, including many UFC fighters uh, who obviously wanted to face the guy, like Fabrizio Verdum, Frank Mir, and now it looks like his first fight, will be, first fight will be against Jadeep Singh, who's a pretty experienced kickboxer with some good wins, but he's currently riding a three-fight losing streak, and he's only had one MMA fight back in India in uh, 2013. Needless to say, fans are pretty disappointed in how this whole played out. Was it a mistake putting this guy in with Fedor? Or do you think this is the perfect warm-up for him? Yeah, it's a, it's a great warm-up for him. You know, it's uh, it's going to be probably very easy. He's going to close the distance real fast because he's a tall guy. That's You know, Japan loves these crazy shows. With a real last time he fought Hung Men Choi, remember that? Mm-hmm. He arm-barred him, and that was like he knee-barred him, a normal person. Yeah. <laughs> That's how long his arms were. So... You know, that's what they love in Japan. He can fight uh, a Teletubby, and, and, and the place will be packed there. He's just a big star in Japan, and people will come from him for him. That, that was my whole thing. Once I started thinking, and I saw Saki Kabara at another event, and I was wondering at the time already, I was in May, why would he be here? You know, and, and slowly but surely, hey, suddenly he has a new organization. Slowly, now suddenly Fedor comes out of retirement. Okay, yeah, this, it has to be. It has to be the reason. You know, because the only guy with star power in Japan, enough star power to fill out a place, would be a foreigner, which is Fedor Emelianenko. Before it was Sakuraba, who made the prize fighting championships. And that's my, always my, and again, a conspiracy theory always is that, you know, once the Japanese don't have a guy anymore they can really root for, who can really be a champion and stay the champion, you know, I, I, I think it's, hard, it's a hard sell. It's like having in America the UFC and not have not one uh, American a champion, you know. I think it's just every country. It, it's it's good for a while, but eventually you want to root for one of your own. You know, you want to you want your team to win. You know, in the in soccer. So why would you constantly root for somebody else? And I I think that's uh, there as well. Fedor though is a different story. He's got so much star power, and the people love him over there. And that's why I figured when I put everything together, okay, yeah, he's kind of like a Sakuraba. Well, I mean, that's the thing. The interesting thing is Sakuraba is actually going to be fighting on that event. Apparently, it's called Ryzen Fighting Federation. Fedor will be fighting. It's not confirmed who will be fighting. Sakuraba apparently is going to be facing Shinya Aoki. Do you think that, you know, A, is Fedor the man who can turn around the whole Japanese MMA scene because it's not doing well? Do you think that having Sakuraba on that card as well uh, will help? Do you think that the Japanese will care about this matchup or do you think the Japanese MMA is too far gone? Yeah, no, I think I think they will be very excited about it. But I think if it would have been just uh, Sakuraba, that would have been a harder sell. I truly believe so. Fedor is just uh, is just uh, right now at this moment, and not listen. In my book, they're both the same. Sakuraba is unbelievable. I love this guy. What he did for for Pride Fighting Championship and for mixed martial arts in general is just amazing. But you know, he came off. Uh, yes, he had a bunch of losses since uh, Vanderlei Silva happened. You know, so. That star power is not there. But, hey, we don't know. Maybe Sakurab's the same thing. He's healed up. He feels better. Let's see what he does. You know, if he comes back and he submits somebody with a crazy fast submission again, mm. people might think, wow, I would love to see him fight again. I would. I would love to see him fight again. Well, you were a huge star in Japan, guys. I mean, there's no doubt about it with, with your commentating, your fighting, everything. What What are the chances that if you if they reach out to you, you'll be involved in this New Year's Eve show in some sort of capacity as an announcer, as an analyst, in some sort of capacity? Would you be open to it? <coughs> no, no. And and I wouldn't get invited. There's this one guy the, that I really dislike, which is we're still involved with uh, Saki Kabara. I, I can't see how Saki Kabara can't see that this guy's a douche. But um, just for that, he was the reason I, I left Pride. 
So I'm not going to be. The, he was the reason, you know, when he got higher up and let got other people fired, you know, it suddenly he tells Mauro Ranello, "Oh, hey, I'm going to be the new producer on the show." And he says, "Mauro, that Mauro said, well done. This is my last show as well." So he was gone right away. <laughs> Just not a good person, and uh, but I don't even want to talk about that guy anymore. I, well, everything to him, he needs money, so it's good for him. He's got a family, so uh, let's just leave it at that. Nah, certainly. Do you think they have the right team to make this promotion go? Obviously, they've got a lot of the old school guys, a couple of douchebags, according to you, in the team. Do you think they have the right team to make MMA take off in Japan? You, no, the, the, there's just one, just one douche, and uh, but okay. for the rest, <laughs> they're all good guys. And uh, but I don't know. I don't know what, what happens if Fedor is gone. What happens if uh, if Sakuraba is not going to win? Can they find the other Japanese star who's not fighting for the UFC, uh, who can really turn it around? You know, starting the the Pride Fighting Championships with the guy who beat uh, four Gracies. You know, at the time he beat Hoist first, but then you know, mm-hmm. I mean, that became a big thing. Everybody knew Sakuraba. I mean, this guy was so insanely famous, and, and still is, and he deserved at least well deserved so. But, um, you know, what if he loses, you know, and, and what if Fedor indeed, you know, has a contact for only two fights or three fights and he goes out, you know, I don't know if they're going to keep that star power. As long as they can find a guy, a Japanese fighter who can, who has that draw and who can beat top foreign fighters, then, uh, then, yeah, then it could, then it could very well be a, a good promotion, just like Pride Fighting Championships. Mm, no, it remains to be seen. Now, Bas, uh, we're going to let you go pretty soon. We just got a few fan questions. Uh, some, obviously, when the fans hear that you're on the show, they're sending as many questions as possible. First one that we chose is from the Real Fog. Real Fog wants to know uh, his question is Bas, some people felt like John Jones got a slap on the wrist with an 18 month probation and community service. What do you think about his sentence? And do you think we'll see him return to being a champion when he returns? You know, Jones is too much of a talent that that cannot go to waste. This guy's going to come back, and if he puts, people are going to love him even more when he comes back now. Because if he if if he fixes it up, if he fixes his problems, of course. Imagine this guy. Imagine Tyson. Like my Tyson, everybody loves Mike Tyson. Still, they do. You know. So I'm not saying, but imagine undefeated. He would have gone undefeated, uh, retired. And and John Jones is the kind of guy <clears throat> who can actually do that. He can make a legacy that not a lot of people are going to do in the next hundred years. You know, it's a he's a very talented guy. I hope he sees that. I hope he sees the influence he has on kids. I hope he makes the right decisions, get the bad apples out of his team. Everybody who introduced him to all that crap, you know, get these people out. They're not there for you. They want to, you know, they just want to hang out with you. They're not your real friends. A real friend wouldn't do that. So um, with the sentence, 72 appearances. You know, yeah, if, if the woman would have been injured, you know, heavenly injured, like lost her baby, he would be in jail. I guarantee you that. But, you know, now using his star power and going to schools and have talks to kids and wherever they send him and talk about his problem, I, I think it will do good, first of all, for, for all the kids uh, that he talks to or the people he, he speaks to, but also for him. Because every time he will relive that moment and suddenly he had to be thinking at this moment, that was so dumb what I did. You know, mm. I could have called an Uber on my on my freaking <laughs> iPhone. Just press one time, click, pick me up, and in ten minutes there would have been a guy. He would have paid half the price of a normal limo or a taxi, and it would have been all okay. You see, so it's but everybody makes mistakes. Listen, if if there would have been social media when I was competing, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure I would have been in trouble. <laughs> you know, I'm not saying I'm this saint guy. Trust me, I'm I'm far from it now. I am. But, you know, I, I didn't do crazy stuff and I didn't jump in the car drunk. That's not what I did, you know, and thankfully. But uh, we all did crazy stuff, everybody. And you learn from your mistakes and he made a hard mistake. And that's the best way sometimes to learn. And then hopefully he's not going to do it anymore. So, yeah, the sentence is on one side you would think jail time. But on the other side, I think 72 appearances. That's, that's, a, that's a lot. Next fan question comes from a man called Mystic Mac 91 he, he's asking, are you giving Alistair Overeem any chances of beating Junior Dos Santos and then beating Fabricio Vadum to become a champion? Do you think he could do it, knowing what, what you know about Alistair Overeem? Well, yeah, if he's in the right state of mind and if he's, you know, comes, uh, the, the, the animal comes out again what he was a while ago, uh, yeah, he, uh, listen, any, any, any fighter who can uh, stop a fight with one punch or one kick or one knee, one elbow, you know, can can turn everything around. I mean, he just needs... In the beginning, when they were fighting and he was still with the Golden Glory team, I always told him in the beginning I uh, to his management, I said, keep him away from Junior Dos Santos 
for now and Cain Velasquez. Because these guys, the two, you know, they will match up bad. Anything else they throw at you, you know, you, you can jump on that. But Alistair is just a phenomenal athlete, man. Everything he throws, and he's got his stuff together right now. He trains with great guys there, Greg Jackson. Yeah, he can, uh, he can make a run for it because he only needs to connect once. That's the power if you have so much force and mm. take, you just have to connect once. And he, he can knock out everybody. Now, the last fan question, Bus, is from Brahma Bull X7. Uh, his question is, when Chael Sonnen was on the show, he said that Holly Holmes' 19 Boxing World titles don't mean anything. Do you agree? Yeah, well, that comes from a wrestler, right? So, <laughs> that's I mean, you know, it's like saying, uh, you know, some people just don't know what it takes to be a real uh, a boxer. In MMA, if it means something in MMA, that's a different story, you know, because I that's what I told Kimbo Slice when he was fighting his uh, first fight against the, the boxer. Oh, I forgot his name right now, but I, he says, what do I do? I say, cross your hands in front of your face, bull rush him up against the fence. I said, it's, a, it's a, an MMA match, man. There's nothing he can box. If you ju- but you got to go. You, you cannot l- walk forward slowly. But if you press full in there, you know, you take away his striking. Once there's a clinch, boxing is gone. There's body shots and maybe uppercuts. But if you know that he can throw those, well, there's ways to stop that as well. And then you just go take him down. Uh, Ray Mercer, actually, was it? You yeah, take yeah. him down and then you, you finish him there. And that, that's what he did right away. You'll see him crossing his hands, bull rushing him up against the fence, a few knees, and then he choked him. So, but footwork, a good boxer, 20, 20 uh, world titles. If she has really good footwork, that's the only key for now, I would say, to, be, to do well against a girl like Ronda Rousey. Ronda, you cannot clinch with. We know this. And it's very hard because she comes gunning for you. But if you cut angles nonstop, left, right, left, right, and move to the side and use really extremely good footwork like a TJ Dillashaw, then there will be no clinch. And then you hopefully, you can pick her out from the, uh, pick, try to pick her apart from the outside. Now, the problem is Ronda has, has a lot of power in her hands now. And she's becoming really good in striking as well. Still, a really good boxer would win that battle. I would say, and I'm not talking about training with uh, other boxers. I'm talking about fighting. That's a whole different experience. You know, in training, when you see her on the focus mitts, I mean, I have no critique whatsoever. And I'm, I always have critique. But she looked really, really good when I saw her in that open uh, workout in Brazil. I go, oh, I hope Betch Guerrero is now fighting, watching this right now. <laughs> <laughs> because that's pretty impressive what she was doing there. You see, but she slowly but surely starts to get that game that she does in the focus mitts. It's transferring now over to the mixed martial arts cage. And in a year from now, it will be there. And then it's really hard to beat her. But really good footwork. The problem is five rounds of five minutes, you know. And, and to, to have that kind of footwork for five rounds and five-minute rounds is going to be very hard to avoid. You're going to need a lot of stamina and, and nothing can go wrong. You can't even trip. Because if you trip, there's the distance is closed. It's um, it's hard. But taking away 20 world titles, that's that's never a good thing to say, of course. I mean, she worked hard for that. And, uh, and she's a true champion. This is the first time we see somebody with so many world champions at a, at a still a competitive age compete in mixed martial arts. All the other guys who fought, they were past 45 years old. Mm. See one who's in their prime and who does MMA. So, yeah. it's But it's the same as saying... Karate, uh, being a black belt in karate doesn't mean anything. Well, it means anything, but does it mean anything in mixed martial arts once they take you down? Yeah, of course. Then it doesn't. Then I hope he has did some wrestling. It is tough to take down, and otherwise he has some ground skills so he can defend uh, submission attempts or the ground and pound. You know, mm. so it's that that's just picking one style apart, and uh, you shouldn't do that. Mm-hmm. Holly Holm is like the Ric Flair of female boxing. Now, Bas, we're going to jump over to the tap out round. You know this round very well. Uh, fun questions, answers sort of with the first thing that comes to your mind, okay? Like word association. You ready? Yep. All right. Who is this Baselina we see on Twitter? What's her story? I was at a friend of my place and he has really <laughs> long uh, um, red hair. And uh, he's a guy, and I, he was standing behind me, and his hair was in my face. I said, I pulled it over my head, and people started laughing and made a picture. And I said, man, this would actually be a TV show, Baselina. And the TV show is that he's on my back the whole time, piggyback, <laughs> and he has the hair over my face, and we're two guys walking around. We swim together, we shower, we go to the sauna. You know? <laughs> I think it would be hilarious. That's hilarious. You definitely need to pitch that. Maybe... Um... Maybe oh, what's his name, Paul uh, Paul Blart? Who's that? Maybe Kevin James will uh, will take on something like that, and he can be the other guy on your back. Uh, it would be a great show for Fight Pass, I think. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Just a few episodes, you know? <laughs> now, Bass, is it true? Does Bass Rutten really watch So You Think You Can Dance while smoking cigars? Yes, I do. I, I love So You Think You Can Dance. I think it's one of the best shows out there. I mean, the <laughs> talent. I Literally, I get tears. My wife is always laughing. Do you have tears in your eyes? And I go, it's it's so amazing what these guys and girls can do. The 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 way they control their bodies, it's uh, I'm I'm blown away with it. But I'm I'm that the same with American Idol or anything that anything talent with me makes me emotional. If I see somebody who's really good at something, I uh, yeah, that I, I think it's the coolest thing ever. Now, when was the first time you said God speed and party on? We want the scenario bus. All right, I tell you where it comes from because um, Garib Sheamus, he was one of the owners of the International Fight League. And it was in 2005, he said, boss, you're going to need a tagline, you know, <laughs> the thing, because people always have these taglines. What would you say? Now, I always said to everybody, party on. I've been saying that since the movie came out, uh, Wayne's World. Mm. And, um, <laughs> and, and so all my friends, I call them Vato and party on. That's always been there. And I always loved the saying from James Bond when they would say, Godspeed, Mr. Bond, uh, yeah, you know? Yeah. And I go, and I looked up what Godspeed meant, and it's you wish somebody a prosperous journey. I go, Godspeed and party on, that's got to be it. Wow, that's awesome. Now, Buzz, we saw a crazy story about you and a friend swerving off the road and flying down the side of a hill, and all you got was a scratch. That can't be right, can it? Yeah, it was. It was, it was the craziest accident uh, the car accident that I had, we, we jumped with the whole car, which was a pretty, uh, convertible. The roof flew off because it was like one of those thin roofs. We had no seat belts. We're spinning, so we're, we're flying over the crash barrier. We didn't even touch it. The police was like mesmerized when they found us later and all the people running down the hill. We're rolling down the hill, back of, uh, nonstop. Nobody flies out for some reason. I'm seeing my friend in the car in slow motion. I see him flying through the car. His, there was skin oh, wow. from his head was on the back window. The, the chairs broke, you know, and I remember him putting him in my guard while we went down. I put my legs around him. I was holding him tight in his head. And I was just focusing on that. Uh, that was so weird what I say now. I was focusing <laughs> on not to see what the, the Terminator sees at the end. Zip, and then you see one dot <laughs> and the one dot. And I, go, I, I was focusing, don't see that, don't see that, don't see that. It was the only thing I was thinking because there were trees and we missed every tree. And then we ended up upside down in the water. And uh, my friend was out, and uh, the water started coming in. Now, I didn't know how deep this was, you know. So I, I had to kick the windows out and then uh, pull my buddy out. And at that moment, when he, I pulled him out, people already were running down there. Everybody was trying to help because they said, Did you, you, you guys are alive. They were freaking out. And uh, it, it, a funny thing was that my, my buddy, he was, uh, he was a fighter as well, Leon Van Dyke. He's the guy, actually, I owe my career to because he was the one sparring partner I found for like 90% of my fights. And um, he, uh, he woke up. And when he woke up, he stood in front of me. I said, are you okay? And right away, he puts his hands up in a fighting position. You know, he thought he was in a fight. <laughs> <laughs> and we started laughing. And these people are looking at like we're the craziest people. The hood of the car was off. When I saw the car the next day, it was my wife's car. Uh, she started crying. The steering wheel was bu- was 90 degree bent because when I shot in the spin, I apparently kept holding the steering wheel. It was exactly like a whole turn uh, twisted in the car. Like it was in front of me, but totally uh, the opposite way in the in the in the length, so to say. And the the wheels they were all like one feet up. The whole car was mangled. It was the it was the craziest thing. And the the, the guy there. He went, uh, dude, uh, uh, how are the people doing in the, from this car? I said, I was driving. And he goes, you were driving? I said, yeah, you have nothing. I said, yeah, I got a scratch. Look, I have a scratch. <laughs> wow. That was the story, actually, that when my friend went to the hospital, he, had to, he needed a lot of stitches in his head. So his skull was showing. Uh, so his whole skin was gone from his, uh, on top. It was away from his skull. And just before he went into the, the operating room, I said, wait, Leon, come back, come back, come back. And because they wouldn't allow me in the operating room, I said, lean over, lean over. And he leans over and I put my finger under the skin so I could touch oh. his skull. And I start <laughs> wiggling my finger under the big scar, you know. And the doctor, he's freaking out. What are you doing? I said, when do I have the chance to touch somebody's skull who is still alive? <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, that was a crazy story, but we survived. It was good.
Well, well, I'm not going to invite you to the emergency room if I get a, a scar, but I don't want you touching any of my bones. Now, last couple of questions and we'll let you go. We do appreciate the time. Have you fought any zombie puppets lately? No, I have not. That was actually really fun to do. That was when we were shooting Here Comes the Boom with uh, a few of these camera guys. You know, they're always hanging around. That these are the camera guys in the making, so to say. And they had their own project and they asked me if I was, uh, if I was interested in, in doing that. I said, yeah, sure, man. I would love to do that. So... Yeah, that was a fun project. Well, speaking of zombie puppets, we're going to finish off this interview with getting you to choose between which zombies you want to fight next, okay? So you got three choices. The first one is who would you rather fight, zombie beavers, zombie Donald Trump, or the zombie Kardashians? Now, think hard, boss. We want a, we want a good answer. And who was the first one? Zombie beavers. There's actually a movie on Netflix right now called Zombie Beavers. It's a bunch of uh, beavers that come back to life and are zombies. Oh, man, that is, that is such a bad plot. <laughs> <laughs> well, beavers are kind of little angry uh, little things, you know, when you're thinking <laughs> they want to snap, snap people. Yeah. With a well, what, about, what about a zombie Donald Trump? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine the hair on that? On the live Donald Trump. The yeah, hair's already in a weird situation. Imagine a zombie version of that. It would be, hey, listen, it would be great to fight any of those zombies with a samurai sword to chop some heads. <laughs> you know, if you're emotionally attached a little bit, you know, it's not like I know Donald Trump, but I say, okay, he's a life person, and then I can choose between a beaver. Oh, I'll chop up some beavers. You know, if you say <laughs> an, uh, a zombie pedophile at 100, you know, I'll take those. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I can do extra damage like that. Then, then I don't mind. Normally, I stay away from the animals. It's I think it's easier to to beat up a person than an uh, than an innocent animal. So who, yeah, who maybe like a is... zombie Jared from Subway. <laughs> yeah, that would be a good one, You see, but that that maybe not with a samurai sword. You wanted to enjoy it. Maybe take some uh, gloves, put it on an, uh, one of those vests that they had in the early days so you, so you don't get stabbed. But that means with a zombie, you don't get bit. You know, yeah. that's what I would do. If I'm like, a, if you look at The Walking Dead and the fear of Walking Dead, why doesn't have anybody that, uh, in, in, in Holland, you call it a Malian colder. I don't know what the name is here, but it's people who make meat and who cut meat. They have this vest. This is all little tiny rings. It's really strong. And if they, by accident, you know, hit, the, hit themselves with a knife with a sharp part, it stops the knife. And I oh. go, man, if I would have been in a situation with all be these zombies everywhere, that's what I would wear everywhere. So when they bite you, they can't get through. So you're never going to get bitten. Mm. I guess it's another reason why Zombie uh, Walking Dead is just simply not based on a true story. So you've pretty much debunked the myth, Bus. <laughs> we're we're going to let you go, Bus. It's always a pleasure having you on the show. And you guys can check out all of Bus's T-shirts, signed gloves, and workout videos uh, at busrooten.worldsecuresystems.com. And, of course, go get yourself an O2 trainer. More information at www.o2trainer.com. Uh, we can't wait to see the new and improved version as well, Bus, the one that stops you drooling. And, of course, you can follow Bus on Twitter at Bas Rudin MMA. As always, thanks so much for coming on the show, Bas. Always a pleasure for us. You're very welcome, guys. Godspeed and party on. There you have it. <laughs> <laughs>